Um, I'm not sure I can fulfill all the expectations. Um, I, I'd like to also say that Paul Henri not only is um, the father, founder, and long term director of this course, but he's one of the perhaps most influential vaccinologists of the late 20th and early 21st century, um, having uh, contributed as head of vaccines WHO to the development of many important, uh, more recently launched vaccines, and uh, having trained generations of scientists as a very generous mentor and um, uh, great role model. So it is my very honor to, to give this lecture today in your name, Pauline. The title is, is a, a challenge, uh, you know, so prospectus for CDA T cell based vaccines. Um, you know, you could speak about parasites, intracellular, mostly bacteria, and speak of CDA, it's viruses, cancer, prophylactic, therapeutic, and so on. So um, I've decided to make a choice and, and speak mostly about prophylactic vaccines against viruses today. So you know, I'll probably not be able to answer all the questions that Polari just uh, brought up. I hope to answer those here. So does CDA T cell immunity contribute to vaccination to use antiviral protection? Uh, maybe also whether CDA T cell immunity can substitute for antibody protection. And last but not least, you know, why we should perhaps care about CDA T cell immunity as a mechanistic correlate of protection. And um, by consequence, if we should care to make CD8 T cell inducing vaccines or even better such vaccines. I would like to claim that the glass is actually half full in terms of CD8 T cell inducing vaccines and not half empty. Um, but you know, when you go to the Bible of vaccinology, um, and I'll bring this slide back a few times during my lecture. Um, uh, you know, Plotkin's vaccines, then uh, this is the table of the correlates of vaccine-induced immunity. And you see that I am facing an uphill battle here. Um, so uh, this is uh, a long, non-exhaustive list of vaccines, and you've got the serum IgG and the T-cells. So I I I'm, I'm here to defend this little thing here. Um, it's, 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 yeah, I I'll see what I can make out of this mission. Um, but let me ask you a question first. Anybody knows these two gentlemen? Almost. Almost, Pastor. Other ideas? No. Not Jenner? No. But I'm not sure I hear it correctly, but this is Ilya Mechnikov and Pau Derlich. <laughs> Um, so I'm showing them here because, um, you know, in the outgoing 19th and being 20th century, uh, there was a big dispute over whether immunity was cell mediated or humoral. And, uh, the cellarists were gathered around Mechnikov, you know, in the French speaking world, um, Paris Pasteur Institute and, um, the Germans, um, with at the time most prominently in terms of antibodies and immunity, Paul Ehrlich at the Koch Institute in, in Berlin. And, and you know that, um, you know, two countries, um, were up for a very difficult future at this time. And, uh, their scientific debates were very hostile oftentimes. So the Swedish Academy, when awarding them jointly the Nobel Prize in 1908, tried to arbitrate a bit. And, um, well, with success, as history has shown. Uh, and um, in the decades that followed, although it's not how the war turned out, the humoralists clearly kept the upper hand. And the table I just showed you still represents that fact. And, and actually, until the 1950s, 60s, nobody cared about cell mediated immunity. And it was only really with transplantation medicine that people were forced to look at T cells again. So this is. Um, you know, how I propose we should look at antiviral immunity. I think it's a T cell, B cell cooperation. And um, there's various reductionist, simplistic, uh, please, you know, accept my apologies for this. Um, I think in terms of effector cells, and not to say others were not important, but we have a very prominent role for B cells, making antibodies, 
that can reduce viral load and CD8, that can kill infected cells or secrete antiviral cytokines uh, to reduce viral loads. And of course, you need CD4s to help both of them. And of course, you need APCs and more. Um, question is whether you know one or the other is more important uh, or uniquely important. I'll discuss three infections with you. Um, SARS will come at the end. <laughs> of course, I won't uh, let that go, but I'll start with flu. So this here, and you notice that uh, the table gives the killed and the life attenuated. And for, for both of them, there's a strong serum IgD correlate of protection, but there is also a CD8 correlate for the intranasal life attenuated flu vaccine. But before talking of CD8s, you know, why do you think antibodies are important? Well, um, one experiment of nature you can always conduct is look at whether babies born to mothers with corresponding antibody have some immunity. And um, you know that uh, babies uh, inherit the maternal IgG and some IgA through breast milk. And um, this is a study that shows that vaccinating mothers uh, prior to giving birth uh, clearly um, reduces the incidence of influenza in the offspring. So the, the only difference between the cases and the, sorry, the vaccine group and the controls here is that the babies got more anti-flu immunoglobulin. So 63% protection is not bad. Makes strong case, I think. This is passive antibody, and I, I have a, a pathetic love for old papers. You'll see a few more of those. Um, uh, this is evidence from the 1918 pandemic, um, where... Uh, you know, physicians uh, at a time, it wasn't even clear it was a virus, right? They just gave convalescent serum to severely diseased individuals. This is a meta-analysis study. And um, overall, the, the data suggests very clearly that there was clinical benefit, about 20 to 30% clinical benefit in terms of survival on average. So we have to admit that antibodies alone can protect against the flu. And... Um, no, the humoralists would say, well, job's done, right? Why talk about C8? Um, is there any role for them in flu? Uh, apparently there is. Uh, and there are situations where you're exposed to a virus and you don't have antibodies, but you may have T cells. And that is particularly so usually when there's a pandemic flu coming. So um, presumably everybody um, above a certain <laughs> low age has once or twice or several times had the flu. So we all have some T cells against flu and T cells are largely cross-reactive um, and uh, notably so for CD8s, they're mostly cross-recognizing different subtypes of the flu. While, as you know, uh, when you have a genetic shift from let's say H3 and 2 to H1 and 1, as it happened in 2009, uh, the antibodies that you have will be relatively useless except those born before 90, uh, 1958. So, for example, I was at the mercy of the virus and my immune defense. And um, so this study here um, correlated the levels of pre-existing cross-reactive CD8 T cells to H1N1 prior to encountering the virus and severity of the infection. And there's a clear inverse correlation. So you can see that those who had um, a lot of um, cross-reactive CD8 cells prior to contracting the infection had a very low uh, symptom score, and those with few cells had a proportionally higher symptomatic score. So it seems that they can at least prevent the worst. They might not prevent infection, but might prevent the worst. So you may say, okay, can we mimic this by vaccinating? Well, it depends what you use. <laughs> and um, Unfortunately, the killed vaccine doesn't do this. Uh, this is a, uh, an excerpt of a, a study looking at uh, antibody immunity induced by um, killed flu vaccine and the um, intranasal life vaccine. I'm not showing the antibody data. They are very comparable. But then you see the pre-immunization, post-immunization CD8 responses. No difference, but the pre and post in the uh, life attenuated vaccine, there is a difference. So the life attenuated infectious virus can induce some level of T cell immunity. I'm not claiming this is enough, but it's at least in the right direction. So I, I'd like to conclude that antibodies alone, again, therapeutic, prophylactic, can protect, but CD8 T cell immunity can mildly the course 
of a pandemic flu infection. And the type of vaccine we use determines whether we only get antibodies and might also get some CD8s. And, um, you know, based on these considerations, CD8s are a potential pillar for building a universal flu vaccine. So that should protect against any variants or any um, uh, H and N uh, serotype coming along in the future. Whether this will work to be seen, but just keep in mind, it's not only the stalk binding, uh, cross neutralizing antibodies, it could also be a CD8 immunity that might protect us in such an instance. My next one is measles. So I'm already almost exhausting my table here. <laughs> and um, so what about measles? Do you know this man? Well, this is asking a bit much. Um, I, I should tell you who it is. It's, it's Charles Janeway, senior, important. He was the physician in chief at the Boston Children's Hospital in the mid, uh, mid 20th century. You may say, well, this name sounds familiar. Yes, it does, but it's not him. It's his son, <laughs> the junior. And uh, it's probably from his book that I stole this image here. Um, so the junior Janeway um, is, is the author or the original main author of the Janeway's immunology. Again, I'm showing it here because I think you all know that you shouldn't even try to vaccinate a baby with live measles uh, born to a measles immune mother because the passive serum provides essentially sterilizing immunity to measles. So it's a good case. Antibody works, right? But Janeway Sr. Uh, did an interesting experiment, and that's why I've shown his um, picture. So he tried the intervention study. And um, so he, he looked for newly diagnosed measles cases uh, in the 1940s. Uh, that was prior to vaccines. And then uh, when there was a family with a child with a, with a rash, uh, went out uh, to check on siblings that had not had documented measles before. And then either gave them a shot of measles convalescent serum, not too much actually, uh, or just left them untreated. And then... Um, followed the uh, occurrence or not of measles. And so you have first the controls here with the striped bars. You see that the vast majority of them got regular measles with all that belongs to it. If you had mild measles, the minor proportion and hardly anyone escaped infection. These were crowded households. Measles highly contagious. You know, if you don't ha haven't had it before, you'll get it. But those that had the passive serum, and this was within five days after the sibling coming down with a rash. So that was not an early intervention. Most of them didn't have any manifestation of measles, about 84%, and the other 16% had a mild course of measles. So antibodies alone, prophylactic, meaning you know, uh, inherited from mother, can protect against measles. Is there any role for CD8s? You can even intervene by giving antibodies. I will claim so. <laughs> I claim so. I've got a prominent supporter here. Who is this? No idea. <laughs> Sorry, I'm making that hard. Um, this is Sir Frank McFarlane Burnett. He's award, been awarded the Nobel Prize in 1960 for acquired immunological tolerance, and he's one of the authors of the clonal selection theory that I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, so Burnett in 68 wrote an article in Lancet, an hypothesis article, and I'm not going to read the article to you, um, but just a few sentences. So um, he stated that there are two distinct systems of adaptive immunity in the body, one mediated by cells differentiated in the thymus, speaking of T cells, the other with immunoglobulin antibody production, so the B cells, and then it comes. The whole process of eruptive stage of measles and subsequent immunity is mediated by the thymus-dependent system, T cells. How could he dare to say this? <laughs> right? Did he know of the babies being protected? Didn't he know that uh, Janeway had successfully prevented measles by convalescent serum? Well, he cites this paper here. And uh, it's a study um, case series of individuals with A-gamma globulinemia. So these are brutal patients. 
they have a sophisticated neurological defect that makes them devoid of any B cells, so they can't make any antibody response. It's a case series. You see one of the patients here, and, and again, I, I read to you um, a few lines. Um, it says, a seven-year-old boy with a gamma globulinemia had typical rubeola when he was five years old. During his sixth and seventh years of life, he was re-exposed by intimate contact with infective cases of measles on three separate occasions. In spite of his known immunological handicap, he did not develop measles after any of these exposures. Interesting. Um, you might say, please bring a big cohort and so on. You, you can't do this anymore these days <laughs> because very simply, um, these patients get immunoglobulin substitution automatically. So no way to do this. Um, but again, this is probably the best evidence. Um, to mention, um, there were many investigators checking on measles-specific T cells, including this publication from 1978 by Bonarino bear. <laughs> so um, there is T cell activity. What do I conclude? Um, well, we all know antibodies alone, prophylactic or therapeutic can prevent or milder measles virus infection, but also CD8 immunity alone can prevent clinically manifest measles virus infection. So the life attended measles vaccine, which largely mimics the immunity established by the mild virus, has two independent mechanistic codes of protection. Again, I'm claiming the glass is half full. You see, I'm making, hopefully making some progress and convincing you of that. That was measles. Now, SARS. When you ask about the role of antibodies, I, I'll always, you know, again, try to play the, the, the Swedish Academy and say, yeah, antibodies are important, but cell mediated is also important. So I'll also show the evidence for, for the other case. Um, when you ask about primary infection with SARS, um, I, I think the, the best evidence comes from B cell depleted individuals and notably those that have B cell depletion theory because of um, multiple sclerosis. And uh, this is uh, an assessment of the incidence of severe COVID-19. So hospitalizations, intensive care unit admission, and death amongst unvaccinated MS patients, stratified for the low risk group. They have no other predisposing uh, conditions. And um, so it's always the observed versus expected. Sorry, this is by um, sort of uh, population control uh, comparison. And you see that those without therapy, they have about the same incidence of, of uh, you know, severe COVID. Those on unrelated disease modifying therapy, you know, think of Fingolimod and um, other antibody interventions and so on, they also have the same incidence. So MS patients per se do not necessarily have a more severe course of COVID-19. But those depleted of B cells, they have about a threefold higher incidence of severe COVID-19. So B cell, de B cell depletion therapy augments the risk for severe um, COVID-19 by about threefold. I, I, I skipped this here. It's, it's nice to sort of side observation. Interfering completely abolished that risk. So um, if you get interferon, then you're well off in COVID-19. But it's not the topic of this talk. So um, B cells and antibody defense milders the COVID-19 disease course, primary disease uh, course in unvaccinated individuals. You also probably all know that passive antibody has been tested. This is one of these multiple studies showing that giving um, antibody, passively monoclonal antibody shortly after exposure to uh, contact with uh, COVID-19 reduces the risk by roughly 80% of getting infected. So uh, same as for the other infections, you can say B cells are important to prevent severe COVID-19 and antibodies alone can do the job. So is there any role for CD8 cells here? I'll for once show a monkey experiment because this one I don't think can be recapitulated in humans. Um, so the group of, of Dan Baruch did this. Um, it's an interesting design. So they, this is convalescent uh, immunity. They had macaques that were given a first SARS-CoV-2 infection and then re-challenged seven weeks later um, and they had no detectable 
viral loads in nasal swabs. No surprise. The control group had not been exposed, had a primary infection, and had a typical viral load curve. But the interesting group is this one. So this group had been infected, and then shortly prior to re-exposure, depleted of CD8 cells. So it's taken away all the CD8. And the question is, what happened to the viral load? So just to be clear, this group of monkeys has antibodies and CD8s, the one in the middle has only the antibodies because CD8s are taken away and those have no immunity here. So this is peak viral loads. And you see it's half-half, sort of, but it's a log scale. So going from complete immunity to CD8-deprived immunity augments viral loads by about 100-fold. So even in the presence of antibodies, CD8s seem to do something. Hmm? Well, I acknowledge there is a big difference to those without, without immunity. Again, the humoralists are not wrong here, but the cell risks have a point. Okay, so in the presence of antiviral antibodies, CD8 T cells contribute substantially to infection protection in SARS-CoV-2. And um, CD8 T cells do something, but can they do so in the absence of antibody immunity? This is not addressed here because here the T cells are always only testing it presence of antibody. So I go back to the MS cohort. Um, obviously, those patients, because it's at high risk, they were vaccinated as soon as uh, the vaccines came out. And then um, there was a follow-up uh, for breakthrough infections. So this here meant simply positive PCR-positive nasal swab, no severe disease or anything. And it was clear. Um, so these are the other therapies, you know, uh, incidence of breakthrough infection as a function of time. And this here is the green is fingolimod, another modestly immunomodulatory drug. The one group that sticks out is those with DB cell depletion, right? Those have a substantially elevated rate of breakthrough infection. We'll come to disease in a minute. So what about severe disease? Because this is the most important outcome, right? Um, I, I tabulated this for you because there's no graph. Um, and uh, in the pre-vaccine era, meaning in primary exposure, the B cell depleted had, here's about twofold, depends on which figures you take and subgroup you take, twofold higher incidence than the other MS patients. Breakthrough infection was also reduced in B cell depleted as it was in the other groups, but the relative reduction was less. So the vaccine reduced breakthrough infections by about 70%, but other uh, patients that did not have the B-cell depletion had a benefit of reduction by 90%. But again, taking a step back and say, hospitalization is one thing. What about death? There was no more death in any MS patient in these cohorts after vaccination. So going from roughly 2% death rate um, amongst documented uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections in the overall MS cohorts uh, prior to vaccination, there were no recorded cases anymore afterwards. So um, vaccination-induced T-cell immunity apparently affords complete protection against lethal COVID-19. What are these immune responses in vaccination of um, SARS uh, against SARS in, in the MS patients with CD20 depletion? Um, showing this study here, uh, obviously antibody responses. This is controls of the you know, first shot of vaccine here, then second shot at T3. You see consistent uh, induction of antibodies to spike. Uh, there is some you know, variable response because depletion is always complete. When you look at spike-specific memory B cells, you're nowhere near, on average, with the um, with the uh, B cell depleted individuals. What was really striking, though, is that CD8 responses in the B cell depleted individuals were higher than in the undepleted, and I don't have an explanation to offer. You know, we can discuss it afterwards if somebody has one, but it's pretty striking. Um, you see here the uh, controls, the healthy, quote-unquote, B-cell sufficient individuals. Um, they make a range of CD8 T-cell response to the vaccine. This is the B-cell depleted ones. So they somehow compensate, perhaps, um, 
for their deficiency in antibodies, at least this may be put to their benefit in, in terms of protection we have seen. So I didn't want to hide this from you. So conclusion three, antibodies alone, prophylactic and therapeutic can prevent or mild COVID-19, but CD8 T cell immunity alone can prevent severe COVID-19 disease and death. And it seems a bit similar to what I said for measles that the mRNA and the viral vector-based COVID-19 vaccines have two independent mechanistic correlates of protection, antibodies and CD8 T cells. Now, you've all heard the lecture about correlates of immunity by Andy Pollard, right? So you might say, this is good, but why care, right? So the antibody crawl is fine. Um, so I, I try to sell that a bit better to you. <laughs> and I, I'll speak a bit to the advantages of the CDT cell immunity in the context of COVID-19 specifically. Um, this is a study looking at uh, cross-reactive vaccine-induced immunity um, cross-reactive to different variants of concern. So individuals vaccinated with two shots um, of, in this case, AT25, uh, so the Janssen vaccine, um, but the same would be true, the data published for uh, BioNTech Pfizer. You see that there is a good antibody recognition of the Wuhan variant, a little bit less of Delta, even less of beta. Omicron looks pretty bad, right? So there is a 20-fold difference or so. Uh, just in binding titers, you see similar things for neutralizing titers. When you look for CDA T cells, this is a very even landscape, very flat. So over 80% of CDA T cells induced by that original Wuhan vaccine are completely reactive to Omicron. So the antigenic evasion of immunity doesn't concern much the CD8 side of immunity. So that, that's clearly, in my opinion, an advantage. Perhaps longevity is too. I mean, maybe the, the final word's not spoken on this, but look, I mean, this is um, now the BioNTech vaccine. You see the peak response at six months, at eight months, and there is a quite precipitous decline that you're all aware of. On the right is the CD8 response of these individuals, and there isn't that much of contraction, at least not over that period of time. So there is a possibility that the CD8 immunity is more durable. That actually was also already observed in the 2003 SARS-CoV-1 outbreak. Of course, patient numbers are much smaller than the trials less uh, controlled, but uh, just two reports, for example, this one here, you know, memory T cell responses um, maintained for 11 years after infection, as opposed to this report about you know, a loss of antibody, detectable antibody and detectable memory B cells after six years only. Um, this is somewhat contradictory to what has been found, for example, for the 1918 flu-induced memory B cells that were found nine years later uh, in individuals. So it's not totally clear what is the final truth, but there may be something to it. I think in all cases, there's not much dispute over the fact that CD8 T cell immunity, or at least CD8 T cell memory, <laughs> is relatively long-term maintained. So I'd like to conclude that CD8 T cell-based immunity mostly covers variants of concern, and it may be more durable than antibody immunity, and so CD8 T cell-based immunity to SARS-CoV-2 can have advantages over antibody immunity that are not necessarily obvious based on the fact that these vaccines work well. Back to my perspective slides. Um, it's been, you know, focused very much on prophylactic viruses, but it should be said that there are many instances where we would greatly benefit from CD8 immunity, you know, besides most of flu, also HIV prophylaxis probably should have CD8 component to it, uh, tuberculosis, malaria, uh, therapeutic hepatitis B and more. Solid cancers are a case. And I'm not going to say much about these many other options because this could be hours and hours, 
just want to show this as an example, you know, um, to the uh, clinical utility, not sure, but, but there is the claim that there is a vector that can induce memory T cells that really um, allow virtually sterilizing immunity against an AIDS virus in monkeys. Um, this is uh, recently um, uh, released data on a therapeutic cancer vaccine that's also targeting CD8 immunity. So uh, relapse in uh, melanoma patients of the removal of, of tumors and then combination with Keytruda. Reduction in uh, relapse-free survival is not massive, but statistically significant. There's a lot of hope in CD8 cells in the cancer field. So again, I think the glass is half full, but we have to face the fact that antibodies plus CD8 T cells are the best means of getting you potent, long-lived and broadly covering immunity. I'd like to thank you and I'd like to thank you and um, congratulate Paul Henri um, because this is an image from last year. This is 10th of May, 2022. Yesterday was Paul Henri's 85th birthday. What an excellent lecture. Thanks so very much for sharing your, your thoughts and the history and, and digging into uh, papers that we were not even aware of. Be great. So, uh, questions, comments, please. Thank you very much. Very exciting talk. I'm over here from the US. So, I assume you may want to um, increase the CD8 responses in existing vaccines, such as SARS um, COVID 2 vaccine. So, questions how would you do it? And second, are there any particular safety concerns that you would be? would be associated with that um, because of the broader reactivity? How would I do it? <laughs> um, I, I think that there is the general observation that, that uh, live vaccines, replication competent or efficient, uh, viral vaccines uh, or mRNA uh, by allowing intracellular expression of antigen and direct delivery to the MHC class one pathway uh, facilitate substantial CD8 responses. I'm not making an absolute statement here because I know that there are, um, you know, uh, adjuvant based uh, protein formulations that may do the same. But I think to this day, uh, these uh, live sort of single round to multi round infectious uh, delivery systems and RNA have an advantage. Obviously, um, the question of the functional correlate is still outstanding. Is it simple numbers of T cells? Is it a certain subset? Uh, I didn't comment on this much. Um, for example, in the flu case uh, for the pandemic uh, flu, the authors uh, correlated the protection to a specific subset of CD8s. We don't really know what we have to induce. So this is a, a very tall order, I think, still for the community today. Um, I I think we have to uh, accept, and that relates maybe to the second part of your question, we have to accept that there are no easy fixes for cd 8 induction. Um, we might have to turn back in certain instances to replicating uh, viral platforms, uh, as it has been done for VSV, uh, Ebola, uh, was acceptable for that indication. Maybe in normal days he wouldn't. Um, there is, for example, some evidence that um, with replicating, let's say, yellow fever vaccine, the peak viral load determines the magnitude of CD8 responses. So it, it will be a, a fine tuning of accepting reactogenicity uh, for the benefit of stronger immunity. And I don't have a final answer to it. Maybe we'll see if Paul Henry has gotten a uh, um, final answer to this. Only, only a simple question. Uh, mm -hmm. Daniel, there is now a new generation of COVID vaccines, which are subunit vaccines. Do you think that it is wise to develop such vaccines 
knowing that we will have a, gener a new generation of mutants as well. I don't know if it's wise to answer this question. <laughs> um, you could argue that if you're regularly re-exposed to SARS-CoV-2, you will maintain your CD8 immunity anyway. Um, thinking of a, a new generation of, of people who've never experienced the virus, you know, heavily hammering them with an antibody-only inducing vaccine may have some drawbacks. But I think the field will tell. Um, I I totally hear your concern and I I understand it. Whether how badly it will hit us, I don't know. There. So thanks, Daniel, for a very nice presentation. So I'm 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 curious. Well, first of all, I want to comment on that. Well, we could include the nuclear protein or other protein in, into cell up. Well, interviral proteins that we know have strong epitopes into the RNA construct. And I think people are working on that to improve the CDH because we know the RNA vaccines can also mediate it. Um, and I think there are strategies working on that right now. Um, these three examples, what, what the, I, I cannot not mention the influenza because actually those data work compared with data where a competing uh, scientific group showed this exact same thing for CD4s. And I think they're still battling about which one mm -hmm. it is. So you could, and I think in most of these cases, you could argue that CD4s could also play a role. How do you, in CD4 activated in K cells and neutrophils and all these secondary mediators, how, how do you differentiate CD4 role from CD8 role? Mm. Of course, uh, you know, dividing the cellarists into CD8 supporters uh, was not, you know, perhaps not a wise thing. You know, the, this is an oversimplification completely. And one doesn't exclude the other, in my opinion. Uh, thank you also for mentioning, you know, the additional targets. I, I am not aware um, of evidence that additional targets besides a very large spike, you know, will increase uh, efficacy, but it may be the case. The CD4 question is, I, I think, is virtually impossible to address in human population because there is no experiment of nature that will tell you, simply because CD4 or class 2 deficiency always gives you severe combined immune deficiency. There is a handful of patients that have a, a TAP deficiency and therefore a selective deficiency in the CDA compartment. You can't draw many conclusions from it. That's also why I took the liberty of showing the monkey depletion experiment. <laughs> um, so I think what it shows is that CD8s can do something. And whether CD8 immunity alone, it is true that the uh, MS patient cohorts, of course, do have CD4 immunity. I didn't show this data, but they have been measured. They're actually equivalent to the non-depleted. So you may have a point. I think as an, as an effector cell, CD4s have been fairly well established in herpes virus infections um, for whenever uh, you can't easily sub differentiate between helper function and primary effective function, I think things get a bit difficult. So for CD8s, this is easy to differentiate, but it may well be what you say. I was just thinking about the analogy of, you know, for a blind person, the, the hearing is heightened. Um, it's like, um, is, is the immunity sort of compensating um, or adapting, like strengthening the quality or quantity of CD8 response in response to B cell depletion or a gamma globulin? Yeah. What it is strengthening, I do not know. Uh, if we take magnitude of response as a correlate of strength, then it might. Uh, th this, however, is an uncertain assumption, uh, at least, you know, when, when you look at correlations in infections like HIV or so, the magnitude of response rarely predicts the uh, virus control function of these uh, T-cell responses. You could speculate, speculate about many mechanisms. 
um, I'm not aware of a study trying to correlate, let's say, breakthrough infections with magnitude of pre-existing CD8s. So if somebody can cite evidence, I'm very happy to hear. I don't know. Further questions, comments, Penny? Take my seat. No, I just, uh, this is Penny Heaton I'm from Janssen. Hi. Uh, and I just wanted to share, this is preliminary data, so I'm just going to caveat it right up front. But it does appear that uh, our T-cell responses on day 29 after vaccination do predict pr protection against severe disease. And it has to do with the breadth of the T-cell clones that are induced and the magnitude of those clones. And so we're working to uh, on, on to confirm that data and hopefully to get it presented and published, but encouraging. And so that could explain uh, the, the other half of the protection. You know, we showed that neutralizing antibody was responsible for about 50% of the protection. Well, obviously it's a combination of both as you so beautifully presented. So thank, thank you, you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you very much for this uh, in very interesting primary piece of evidence. Looking forward to read this <laughs> when it comes out. And congratulations on, on uh, collecting this evidence. It's not, not obvious to do. Mm -hmm. There are two hands up over there and here. Um, this is maybe my second time asking the same question. So it's really the live attenuated virus vaccine, I guess, which has multiple arms of re responses starting with the innate and also the humor response as we always expect in neutralizing antibody and also the CD8 uh, protection. So you showed the picture half full and half full. <laughs> so how, this is a vague question, but what would be your interpretation of having these multiple responses to be interpreted into vaccine efficacy and maybe into the, maybe into this severity? Because we, we understand there are multiple arms, but we cannot only like focus to the, or um, understand only the neutralizing antibody will be really responsible. So what would be your advice to interpret? There is probably not one answer to your yeah. question. Um, I think if you have a vaccine that perfectly matches the challenge, quote unquote, um, strain of virus, then it's probably teamwork of of humoral and cellular defense and you may even be able to rely on only one of them uh, particularly antibodies mm -hmm. i mean it's shown passive antibody insufficient amounts will do the job uh, i think whenever there is viral variation coming into it uh, then things get more complicated and yeah. if you have to rely on antibody alone and um, then you might rely on the other half <laughs> of, of your full glass now we don't even know if you know, neutralization is a perfect correlate of, of protection. Um, maybe, you know, Penny has uh, more insights into this. But I think ideally we always want to have vaccines that induce both arms of immunity. And uh, I haven't spoken much about memory B cells, but they also, under certain circumstances, can be a correlate of immunity. And, and the, the famous example is hepatitis B vaccination, which protects against chronic infection, even after antibody titers have dropped essentially to undetectable levels. So there are, of course, multiple pillars uh, of antiviral defense, uh, which may be more or less important, each one of them, depending on the context of infection challenge and the timing. Timing, we have time for two more questions. Just a practical question. I could read the paper, but how were the uh, monkeys depleted from their T cells? That seems like really difficult. <laughs> it's an anti CD8 antibody. Um, you know, they have all the tissue resident lymphocytes, and how do you? Well, the tissue resident cells, you're right, at least I noticed from mice, they're not getting depleted. Um, sorry? Oh, okay. But so it is true, if, if you had not seen any effect, you wouldn't know much. <laughs> but because you see a hundredfold increase in viral loads, you can tell that the depletion acted on the CA compartments that needed to be depleted. Uh, this approach, I think, 99 plus percent uh, depletion efficiency. 
So it's the analogous thing to an anti-CD20, but it's directed against the CD8 core receptor molecule. And uh, it, it can be done for also other uh, immune cell subsets. And uh, it's being done mostly, or previously mostly in the SIV field for monkeys. Um, I don't know of any human use. I wouldn't see any, <laughs> um, an anti-CD8. Uh, whereas anti-lymphocyte, so anti-T cell, uh, anti-thymocyclobulin obviously is used in, in transplantation medicine. I think there is a comment, please. That, that's here. That, oh. That's a question for you, in fact. The, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you didn't mention zo zoster, oh. and um, I'm, I'm interested to see your view on the potential role of CD8, but considering that the vaccine does not really induce CD8, but mainly CD4 T cells, so it's back to the question from, from Dennis. Do, do you think CD4 and CD8 co can cooperate? What's, what's the link between the two? In, in a lesion, for example. Well, uh, I'm getting all the hard questions now. <laughs> <laughs> what do I think? We, we can I mean, discuss over a beer if you really want. Um, I, I think that, as I've shown in this simplistic schematic at the start, CD4s, of course, do help CD8s. And having a CD4 correlate doesn't exclude the possibility that there is a CD8 mechanism contributing, which again, doesn't exclude that CD4s are also effectors. So it's, it's a little difficult. And, and I, I don't think I want to draw a clear, a sharp line here between the two cell types. You're very diplomatic here. <laughs> there was a question. Well, if we just had time for a compliment, I mean, we've had outstanding lectures, but that was, that was great. And, okay. and I, I just, I feel like I learned a lot about sort of each arm when you were trying to sort of focus on one. So thank you for such a great thank you presentation. Very, much. very kind of generous. Okay.